holy smokes, how do you get an American up here giving quotes in Estonia? There's no way I'm even going to try to replicate that. I have enough problems being from the South talking the Queen's English. So I'm the last speaker of the day, which either means they save the best for last or I'm the only thing between you and the bar. And so what we're hopefully going to do is have a conversation about influ influence operations from an I.O. perspective. When you look at this, basically, I.O. was originally defined in 1998 in Joint Pub 313 out of the United States, and it talked about six major efforts, um, including um, computer network attack, physical destruction, we talked about propaganda, we talked about deception, OPSEC. So it's been around for a while, I.O., and it's, it's been refined, and now everybody's talking about cyber operations and so forth. But the key, I think, here is you got to talk about how you're going to influence people. And what's amazing, and what I thought was really interesting, was the Microsoft discussion where the lady was talking about cyber warfare. Here's a commercial company talking about cyber warfare. So what in some um, circles is looked as the military has definitely gone beyond that. And all the speakers you've seen in the last two days, and as well as in this panel, are talking about the broader implications of I.O. or influence operations. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to use history as well, because once again, when you start talking about cyber, when you start talking about I.O., it can get classified real quick. And so in an unclassified world, a lot of times historical examples work pretty well. Um, we go back to the Balkans, to Serbia, so to Milosevic. And at the time, the uh, Allied Coalition, which included some NATO countries, was trying to um, get Milosevic out of Serbia. So um, what do they do? They look at the tools in their arsenal. And they have entirely incredible air uh, weapons at their disposal. Uh, we have total air superiority in that area. So they start a bombing campaign. And for 54 days, they're doing a bombing campaign. Serbia is only so big. And at, at some point, the rubble starts bouncing because you're bombing the same targets over and over. At that point, on day 54, they decide to start conducting some I.O. Um, activities. And at that point, once again, pre-internet, uh, if you will, they were using faxes, they were using phone calls, they were using face-to-face um, -face visits. What they were trying to do is they were trying to influence Milosevic to leave Serbia. Obviously, the bombing was not influencing them. So what they did do was they went to the people, his cronies that were financing him, and they started influencing them, saying that if they didn't stop supporting him, they'd start losing their factories, they'd start losing their supplies, they'd start losing their money, and so forth. And within two to three weeks, they quickly capitulated. So once again, that's how you can use I.O. That's how you can conduct an influence campaign. And what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes is basically how to do that. How can you model that and how can you basically try to develop some metrics from that to conduct I.O. And, and as from an influence model. So just like the other speakers and just like many people here, I believe that a new lexicon is needed. I believe there's a huge gap between the transformations that are occurring in information cyber and our ability to grasp what's occurring. There was a speaker, the very first speaker this morning talked about the huge digital revolution that's going on. And I agree with him 100%. We have a shortage of tools, our vocabulary. Once again, the speakers mentioned we don't have the right words. We don't have the right, the le right lexicon. We can't understand. And we're lagging behind what's going on as far as the world, there's a gap, and we need to develop a theoretical construct. We need to try, try to develop some models that can better explain events in this new era. So the basic question one must ask is, how do you model I.O., or how do you model cyber? And we're doing this to an extent. If you want to talk about networks, we can model networks. In the United States, they have the Joint Information Operations Range, or the JIOR. And they can build any network that you want. You can come in, you can bring in your hardware, you can bring in your software. You can model what would happen if you do an attack here or do an attack there. And so we can do that from a network architecture. We can model I.O. They're starting to do that with ICS, industrial control systems. In the United States, for example, they have, they've got a couple of facilities. There's a uh, former mental hospital and there's a former uh, prison that they're now utilizing. They're bringing them into shape and they're going to start building out from an ICS standpoint where you can come in and look at the different systems and look at SCADA and you can do your attacks and you can see how that will affect the electrical systems, the water, and so forth. So when it comes to things like that, you can model. But when it comes to try to influencing right here, it's very, very tough to develop a model. And what you're seeing on the slide there is some of the 
ideas that I came up with my dissertation. I've been working on this for about 10 years, um, between a couple books, a dissertation, and now the journal, where I've been trying to research and write articles and trying to determine what are good models for I.O., what are good metrics, and to date, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's, it's a very tough question. Once again, if when you look up there, you're trying to determine if the models are relevant to the real world, and therefore, if, if the model is relevant, and, how's, and if the model is built correctly. And so that's what I try to do in some of my research, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The other question is, how accurate is your theory? Or how accurate can a model really be? Because if the theory doesn't describe, explain, predict, or prescribe what's really going on, then is it really a theory or is a model that's accurate? You know, and that's really difficult because when you're trying to talk about I.O., you're trying to talk about the human mind, and you're trying to talk about how you can influence the human mind. I don't know if any of you guys have teenagers, but you cannot influence them whatsoever. And that's trying to influence somebody. Think about when you're trying to do that for a different culture. Think about when you're trying to do that for somebody that's halfway around the world. So in essence, a lot of times, influence ops or I.O. is much more of an art than it is a science because you're trying to get into somebody's mind and to make them do something they would otherwise not do. The problem with these is that we don't, the problem with these ideas about models is that we don't have an overall theor theoretical construct for I.O. Um, I, as is mentioned, I'm the chief editor of the Journal of Information Warfare, and uh, we do conferences, and when we do our conferences, we go to the big tent theory for I.O. So we have people from hardcore cybersecurity, cyber attacks, all the way over to OPSEC, deception, and PSYOP. And so it really is a huge group and area. And so you have people that will come to conference with an electrical engineering background and an international relations background. And there's no synergy right now between that. So what's hurting us, and once again it was mentioned earlier, is it's the lack of standardized nomenclature, the lack of standardized taxonomy and ontologies that all need to be developed so that we as a group can determine how we're going to try to develop metrics from these different areas. So when I was doing my original PhD research, I, was, I used to be a former naval officer, as I mentioned. And so I came from a military background, and we started talking about a top-down model. And here's an example of an overall high-level top-down model. And if you start on the right side, it talks about trying to develop a coordinated overall strategy within the US government. You know, the targets are trying to improve perception and so forth, and you have a monitoring system. So this is a holistic model where the DOD, Department of Defense, is involved with the U.S. State Department, with some NGOs, with other um, departments in the U.S. government, and you're all working together, and it's all synchronized, and everybody is working together almost like an air tasking order if you were doing a military operations. The problem with this is that it doesn't work like that, and we saw this over and over in some of the discussions this week. You had um, the Vice Admiral from NATO, ACT, talking about the, the, the need to harmonize operations, and that's what this attempt is. So when I was doing my research, I interviewed about 100 people over um, a multi-year period, and a lot of them wanted to have a top-down approach. They wanted to have a very centralized control of I.O. The problem is, a lot of times, in reality, it just doesn't work that way. There's not the funding, there's not the ability to work with the different organizations, there's different priorities and so forth. Here's a uh, more drilled down model or a drilled down look at a uh, top down theory. And once again, it was mentioned that parts of IO are not new. There's, if you want to go back to deception and Troy, or even uh, I'm from Yorktown, Virginia, they had deception with Washington and Cornwallis in the final battle of the Revolutionary War. Parts of IO have been around forever. But the new part is the ability to communicate, the cyber part, the ability to reach around the world. So it is a combination of ancient and recent technologies. And in order to measure success, in order to determine your return on investment or your metrics, you need to use a variety of methods to do that. And that's what I've been struggling with as I try to do this research. So once again, the top down, while initially many, many interviewees and um, personnel that I interviewed advocated this approach, in the end, it kind of, it just got too hard because you could not get the different groups and organizations to work together. So then I looked at a bottom-up model. And uh, let me give you two historical examples of, say, the top-down versus the bottom-up. One would be 
and they're both from Operation Desert Storm in 1991. A top-down model would be the deception campaign with Saddam Hussein, where basically we um, used a lot of amphibious operations, we used a lot of TV um, interviews, we used a lot of um, information, if you could, to persuade Saddam and his uh, generals that we were going to do an amphibious attack in Kuwait and that we were going to do our uh, main thrust right up that route along the coast. And that's where the majority of the Iraqi forces were um, for, uh, focused. In reality, we know that once we started doing the bombing campaign, we took out the radar, we took out the uh, Iraqis' ability to see across the desert, we started to move the huge army forces out to the west, and we did the left flank. So that's a top-down because it's very well orchestrated. They got the uh, media in there. They got everybody coordinated. You even had um, admirals and generals saying, yes, we're ready to do an amphibious assault, and it never happened. A bottom-up example from that same conflict would be the use of propaganda leaflets. Um, if deception is aimed at one single person, that single decision maker, then propaganda, as he mentioned, is aimed at the masses. It's aimed at the larger group. So we're dropping leaflets. We're doing radio broadcasts for the Iraqi military. And, and once again, the leaflets are showing them that they're, um, they can have food. They can have fresh fr fruit, if you will. They can, if they um, surrender, they can be um, welcomed by their Arab brethren and so forth. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqi soldiers surrendered with the leaflets in hand, which greatly increased our ability to conduct that campaign without loss of life. So once again, that's a decentralized campaign where you're uh, putting the information out and letting people make their own minds and their own decisions. So as I continued my research, I ended up gravitating more toward the bottom-up model or the decentralized model from a how would you model I.O., how would you conduct influence operations, how would you develop metrics. And once again, this basically says that you will try to conduct I.O. in a decentralized environment. You will, you will work with key decision makers, but you will also accept any and all actions that are conducted. You basically try to put out, here's the goals, and let's see how we can get it done. There's no centralized funding, there's no centralized coordination, and it's not as um, synchronized as before, but in actuality, it's probably more practical and pragmatic based upon how the different agencies work and the funding available. And here's another example of that sh showing specific, you know, once again, how it can be done from a bottom up. And the interesting thing is that originally when I started my research, I was focused a lot on government agencies. But as we hear today, as I saw back then in my research, it's not just government agencies that are conducting influence operations. It's non-governmental organizations, it's commercial organizations, you know, it's long since been a time when the DOD controlled its networks. The networks are basically provided by uh, commercial providers. They're providing services. Um, we saw, as an example, of the ramifications of um, Edward Snowden and how the uh, commercial organizations are um, taking their uh, and moving their data. This particular issue of the journal was um, published in April of last year. Every single article was written by a serving member of the NSA. Uh, they're either a GS or an SES, uh, very top-level personnel. The reason we did this is because I went to the NSA about two years ago, right after um, the incident with Snowden was published, and I basically told them that their public relations had a major problem <laughs> and that I could help them out. And so what we did is we've been collaborating for the last two years. We wrote this first journal last year, and then the newest one's coming out as we speak. But they realized that they need to do some influence operations as well with the after effects uh, from Snowden. So where do we go? How do we develop metrics? How do we model I.O.? And once again, I think it comes down to what some of my colleagues talked about as well. And there's some similar themes here. Uh, you mentioned our Kill and Ronfeld. He, uh, those were gentlemen were major parts of my dissertation. You mentioned Tim Thomas, once again, a great um, Russian I.O. expert. They're all saying the same thing. Basically, the problem is there's no real clear definition of some of these terms. Everybody has their own term for I.O. or cyber warfare. You know, we don't have a glossary. Every, people will indiscriminately change from I.O. to cyber back and forth. And so what they mean means different things to everybody. So there's no complete um, taxonomy or ontology or glossary. You need to do a mind map. You need to figure out how these things work together. And, how, and once again, it's all becoming interrelated. There's much more commercial involvement in 
well, even before, it's from 10 years ago when I started my research now, the commercial companies are much more involved. And in fact, in many ways, they're becoming major players. You need to have a component list. You need to determine who's doing what, the methods, the processes. And then finally, you need to try to develop a mental model of how I.O. can be used, appropriate the data, and so forth. I think the key to understanding this is that the world is incredibly diverse from an information and power aspect, and that no one can control it. It's got competing interests and needs, and that in the end, it'll never be totally controlled. The best you can do is try to manage small part. You need to be pragmatic about this. You need to understand that it's better to work with others and to try to coordinate with different agencies. And by loosely trying to work together with policies and strategies, rather than trying to mandate from the top, which in my personal opinion, I don't think will work. I think we should have broad architectures. I think we should have structures and standards that can work together. I think we should have some consortiums of academics, practitioners, government personnel. They're all working together. And in that way, you can try to develop a series of metrics and try to determine what's the best way ahead to model from an I.O. perspective. Actually, run a little fast. Are there any questions? We're going to do the question round uh, now together. Uh, sure. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction. <laughs> <laughs>